Asalaamu As Alaikum, my name is Aman Opsia. On behalf of Hiran Online, I would like to welcome you to an exclusive interview with Congressman Keith Ellison. Asalaamu As Alaikum, brother. As -alaikum. It's good to see you again, good to see you. as always. Good and it's an uh, Ramadan Kareem and an Ramadan Mubarak to the entire Somali community and everyone who listens. And I'm just honored to be here with you and I uh, look forward to our conversation. Thank you, thank you. Um, so Keith Ellison, you are the first uh, Muslim American congressman. True. And you've done great work and... Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I got there because I got help from the Somali community in my district. And, we, and we, we're, we're here for you and as you know, I always say out of the 535 members of Congress, you're our number one ally and we appreciate all the work you do. And so um, Somalis in Minnesota, Somali Americans are very worried in this Trump era, this era where Islamophobia is rampant, you know, the Muslim ban, you've been on the front line fighting the good fight and we appreciate that. What are your thoughts on the Muslim ban, on the immigration laws that Trump's you know, administration has imposed and, and what we could do, I guess, as a constituency and as a community at large to combat some of these discriminatory laws? This is a great question. What's going on now is that there is a challenge in the courts uh, because in truth it is a Muslim ban. You can, he, he now wants to call it a travel ban, but it's a Muslim ban. He started out saying it was a Muslim ban. He said it on the campaign trail. He's reaffirmed this, you know, many, many times. So the real question is he's trying to clean it up. And he's trying to make it so oh, it's not really a Muslim ban, and this is why he pulled Venezuela into it and a few other countries. But we know this is just subterfuge for being a Muslim ban. So these things are being sorted out in the court. Right now, uh, the state of the law is that uh, if you are from Somalia, that a, a immigrant or non-immigrant visa is not going to issue for you unless you can show it's in the na it is in the national security interest of the United States. Uh, there, it, there would be a, a hardship imposed upon you if you were not able to, to come uh, and that uh, you don't pose any security risks. If you can get through that, then you can get a waiver. But right now, we have to battle this thing in court. But you asked me what can the people do. What the people can do is to continue to raise their voices and bring forth stories. It helps me a lot when uh, members of the Somali community can say, look here, Brother Keith, you know, my cousin has to come here because, you know, we had a illness in the family and we need somebody to come help my, uh, us because my mom is going through chemo. I mean, these kind of stories would show the human cost that this ban, this unlawful discriminatory ban is imposing are very helpful. And then people, we can still have talk-ins, we can discuss this issue, we can share information just like we're doing now. But the awareness has got to be there. And the other thing, brother, is that this is a time for Iman, you know. You know, it, is, it will not serve anyone well for people to get discouraged, to get cynical, to feel like, oh, nothing's going to happen, we're just messed up. No, no. After the hardship comes the ease. And we have to have faith in this and, and just continue to speak out, reach out, push out, and work with elected officials who it's their job to represent the community. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think we need to do. Thank you, thank you. Um, sticking with the theme, I guess, of Islamophobia and yes. how it affects the Somali American community, not only were you the first uh, Muslim American uh, member of Congress, if I'm correct, you were, also you, the, right. you were also the first Muslim American legislator in Minnesota. Yes. So if I could ask you maybe a state-related question, sure. uh, dealing with the legislator and state issues. Many Somali Americans in Minnesota are vexed right now, and they're angry and they're disappointed about they're right to be. about the um, the child care centers. Uh, the, I don't know if you heard. There's a about the controversy about child care centers defrauding the state. Um, some people are even accusing them of uh, sending money to terrorists by you know with the state funds and the whole nine. And so, one of the number one issues, or the number one issue with this issue is that Somali American small business owners who actually own these uh, child care centers are not allowed to testify at the Senate hearings. So what, what advice would you have as an esteemed politician, you know, long experience, 
a veteran in the game, what what uh, advice would you give like the Somali American small business owners who own these child care centers who are having trouble piercing into the legislature? Well, this is morally repugnant. They should go public and say that it's wrong. Every member of our community ought to, should have a right to offer testimony at the state legislature. There's no way that uh, you can form good legislation unless you have all perspectives. And if you want to write bad legislation, then, you, then the best way to do that is exclude people. If you want to write good legislation, you get all voices in. And let the legislatures, legislators have a full body of information with which to make a decision. So we've got to denounce it, we've got to oppose it, we've got to say that it's wrong, and we've got to keep on pressing. And the, they can't keep members of the Somali community who own child care businesses from coming to the hearing. So come to the hearing, and if you can, bring a side into the hearing and say, they won't let me in. Maybe go to the hearing and put tape over your mouth, mm -hmm. and then when the reporters start asking you, why is it, what's that about, say they won't let me speak. They've silenced me. In the, in the democracy of America, they have silenced me in the people's house. So this is, um, you gotta engage in political theater a little bit to drive your point. And this is the kind of thing we have to do. But let me just say this, Brother Ayman. There, there's no community in, the, in, in Minnesota or the United States where there's not somebody who did, the, did something wrong. There might be a few Somali uh, um, child care vendors who didn't follow the rules right, but that's no different from any other group. We don't say that Somalis are better than everyone, but they're not worse. And so this is a human problem. Let's deal with it as a human problem. Let's not try to single out one community. The vast majority of Somali daycare providers are doing a wonderful job. They're doing a great job. They're taking care of people. And the subsidy they get barely costs, barely meets their costs. And so if some people did the wrong thing, what can we do about that? They gotta be, they gotta answer. But the Somali child care organization, the trade organization, I've been in touch with them and I can tell you they are doing trainings to make sure people know what the rules are. They're helping, they're learning people to say don't violate the rules, stay on top of the rules because our community fairly or unfairly is being scrutinized extra. I think it's unfairly. And the Somali trade organization is doing a lot of good work uh, to try to make sure things get, 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 get worked out. But I absolutely oppose the Fox 9 story. I issued a denunciation of the racist, unfortunate uh, story they ran. They tried to say that people who, that there's, a, there's all this money and they're taking it and then they're using it to fund terrorism. This is a lie, it is wrong, it's immoral, and it will hurt people. And they relied on only one guy who lives in Seattle for their whole story which in my opinion is bad reporting. It's not a matter of just perpetuating Islamophobia and racism because the Somali community faces both. You know, you got some people who are white-skinned Muslims, alhamdulillah, these are our brothers and sisters, of course, but they don't necessarily deal with that racism. But the Somali community is black and Muslim and faces challenges that uh, that uh, you know really are unique and uh, but the, I want the Somali community to know that's not alone. It has a lot of friends, not just me, a lot of friends, you know. And uh, so we're just going to stand together and push back. If I could add one point, I always uh, say that Somalis are, like you said, they're unique minorities because they're black, so they deal with racism. They're Muslims, so they deal with Islamophobia, and generally speaking, they're immigrants, so right. they deal with. So I always say immigrants they're immigrants are children of are children of immigrants, right? And so I always like say you, you're not an immigrant. Yeah, I was born here, but I'm a uh, quasi immigrant because I'm a chill, child of you know immigrant right, right. parents. So I always say Somalis or Somali Americans are triple minorities. They're three yeah. minorities in one. Yeah. So I, I thank you for and even the folks like you who are born here, you have immigrant sensibilities yeah. because this is uh, who raised you. This is who you're around. So. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, question of go back to the federal side about you know legislation and things you're doing in Congress, right. as you know, there's uh, always been an issue with the remittances. Always, man. We've been dealing with this for years. Yeah, and you've always been in the uh, forefront fighting this fight, even when it wasn't like trendy. You know, we thank you for that. Somali Americans and just Somalis in the diaspora in general, 
they're the number one, what I call foreign direct investors in Somalia. Yeah, of course. And so this issue of remittances is kind of like a life or death issue. It's kind mm -hmm. of a survival. True. So the light we call it a lifeline. So if you could give us any updates or any strategies uh, to help, yeah. uh, you know, ameliorate these issues. Well, the first thing I want to say, my brother, is that if you look at when Rosa Parks first was put off the bus mm -hmm. in 1954, it wasn't until 1964 that we passed the Civil Rights Act, it wasn't until 1965 that we passed the Voting Rights and the Immigration Act, 68, till we passed Fair Housing. So what's my point? This is not gonna be an overnight fight. Right. It's wrapped up in a lot of stuff, but I will tell you that what we've been doing, when we have gotten about two pieces of legislation passed, and my, they've been my bills and they haven't been enough. I'm going to be honest with you. I still got a lot to do on this. Uh, but we've been, I've been in the minority, in the Republican majority, and it's been tough. But we're not going to stop fighting. We're going to keep it up. What are the two bills? One bill is that it would reduce the uh, number of, um, of audits that a money service business has to have. If they get a state audit, they don't know how to get a federal audit. They've, and the audits cost a lot of money, so they reduce it. You get the state, the federal government will accept a state audit. It doesn't have to be a separate, you don't have to have two audits anymore, so that's good. The other thing is that we put in a pilot program uh, that would start working on ways to better funnel remittances. It's not a broad program, it's a narrow one, but it's there. And then the third program is a study with the General Accounting Office on how to solve this remittance problem. I've, uh, I've, I've convened many meetings on this. We've had them both in Washington and in the Twin Cities. We've spoken out on it, uh, and we've met with many, many banks. But I'm just gonna tell you, you take a bank like, say, Wells Fargo, you, you know, they just got caught defrauding uh, depositors, all kinds of folks have gotten in a lot of trouble for the stuff they've done. They got in trouble for racialized steering, mortgage discrimination. But here's the thing, I remember back in the day, 10 years ago when we went to them and they were among the first saying, oh, we're closing Somali remittance businesses accounts. I was in a meeting with them downtown Minneapolis. We're closing accounts because you know we, we, it's costing us too much money. We would do it, but it's costing us too much money. Well, this is the same bank that's found out ripping off people years later. What's my point in, in making that point? I believe that the American banking system can do Somali remittances just for one reason or another they don't want to because they sure can do other stuff um let me also say that the in financial services sector is not against doing somali remittances it's just that we have this legislation called the bank secrecy act and the anti-money laundering bill and there are a lot of restrictions that they put on banks and if the banks don't meet them then they get fined heavily or whatever so a lot of the banks just said you know what it's a hassle, we're not gonna do it. But what this has done is it shut off opportunities to send money, send that lifeline home. Well, of course, Somalis, and I'm gonna tell you this, there's a lot of business talent in the Somali community. What have they done? Legally transport money through suitcases, legally. It's legal to do this. All you have to do is fill out the right paperwork and you can do it. Well, the Somali, the Somali business people are doing this. And now what do the reporters do? Say, oh, they're shuffling money through suitcases. Well, this is because the legitimate avenues have been closed off. And if you were any kind of a reporter, you would know that. Well, some people just jump into it and don't really take their crap very seriously. But, you know, what we've got to do on this front is to continue to make the case. Brother, I'm gonna tell you this. I don't care who's the Secretary of Treasury. It might be Jack Lou or it might even be Steve Mnuchin. I'm gonna keep on pushing this because not only will it help Somalis in Somalia, not only will it help my constituents bring them peace of mind knowing that their relatives are okay, it will make the financial services community more transparent. Because through this refusal to work with us on remittances, what it's really done is force people into systems that are more opaque. And honestly, if you're walking around with a sack full of money, that's dangerous to you. Do you really want to be walking around the streets of Dubai with $100,000 uh, in a suitcase? I don't want you doing that. I'd rather you push a few buttons and the money goes where it's supposed to go. 
you know, you can get, people will kill you over that. And so it's, it's, it's less transparent, it's more dangerous, it's a mistake, it's a failure by our society. And just one last question on foreign policy. Um, you've always been a friend of Somalia. Oh, yeah. And you've always... Uh, Somalia is my number one foreign policy priority. And, uh, and I personally know that. And I uh, wanted to... So we want to know, I guess, generally speaking, Somalia Americans in particular, Somalia is making a comeback, it slowly is. but for surely. It is. The uh, peacekeeping force known as Amasam is slowly going to withdraw. Yeah. So the number one issue for Somalia is its security. Right. And there's a UN em arms embargo in place. Yes. Like what, what is that? We, we know as a, we know it has to be lifted. So it does have to be lifted. I agree, and I, am, I have actually worked on this issue. I've been in touch with people with the, at the United Nations. I've been in touch with our embassy and actually have helped advocate for a relaxation of it, mm -hmm. but it's still partially in place. And look, you know, um, I have always believed that in that Somalia, for some people, is an industry. And what I mean by that is if you it used to be if you wanted to talk Somalia, you had to go to Nairobi. And the people didn't want to change that because it's like, well, they're getting paid with that way. Well, the truth is we need to move. We need to put Somalis in charge of Somalia. Somalia has had several peaceful transitions of power. Uh, we've gone from, pre I think we're now on the third president, peaceful transfer of power. It has consolidated, the re it's working on the regional conflict. I'm not saying they're solved yet, but they're talking about it, not shooting about it. This is a good thing. Um, there, you haven't heard about a piracy case in literally years because this has been reduced. And so there are a lot of good things going on in Somalia. Somalia still uh, is subject to v drastic weather events which uh, create which create a need for our men who are under the authority of the Somali uh, government. Why? Because these w extreme weather events, they might be drought, flash flood or whatever, create hardship. And what do people do in hardship? Sometimes they take advantage of each other. So you need somebody who can be an authority to make sure that the food distribution is proper so that people have proper security, so that Al-Shabaab can stay uh, on the run. And by the way, Al-Shabaab is not threatening for uh, control of Somalia. They used to, mm -hmm. now they're not. And this is because Somalis, many have lost their lives, many of them have been hurt, injured, maimed, have made um, you know, protection of their country a priority. Somalia is on the comeback trail, and it needs its partners in the United States. Uh, I would say we need to get rid of this, this weapons ban, uh, I believe this, I mean, when, when in, during the last president, I was advocating for this. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the way, Al-Shabaab doesn't have a weapons ban, you know. All the, pe <laughs> all the people who want uh, them to get the bombs and the guns, they get them to them. It's just a government that is restricted. So, uh, you know, I think it's time to move forward on this. You know, my hope, you know, look, Somalia has more coastline than any country in Africa, including South Africa. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Somalia has fishery, fishing, it has rivers, it has plenty of uh, fertile land, it has so many things, it has beaches more beautiful than any, anything I've seen in the Caribbean. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, and so it has just tremendous potential. What Somalia needs is direct investment. What Somalia needs is a strong economy, it needs to get people back to work, it needs to get some cranes going and rebuild Mogadishu. That's my take on it. And not just Mogadishu, because if you only build Mogadishu, that'll be a problem. Because you got Bosaso, you have uh, what, you know, you have a lot of different cities that need that development. And, uh, but this is what we have to do. We have to build, rebuild the country. And that means you got to have security. So that's where I stand on this issue. Thank you for the interview, Keith. My pleasure. Take care, brother. Yeah, yeah. Take care, my friend. Zakalahan. Ramadan Mubarak. Yeah.